dwarf, electrons and protons fuse together to form neutrinos and neutrons. These neutrons are also fermions, but with nearly 2,000 times the mass of an electron, their degeneracy pressure is even stronger. So <laughs> this is what holds pressure. up neutron stars. Hey, there was this conviction among scientists that up, even if we didn't know the mechanism, boy, bad, something would prevent a star from collapsing into a single point and forming a black hole. Because black holes were just too preposterous to be real. The big blow to this belief came in the late 1930s, when J. Robert Oppenheimer and George Volkoff found that neutron stars also have a maximum mass. Shortly after, Oppenheimer and Hartland Snyder showed that for the heaviest stars, there is nothing left to save them when their fuel runs out. They wrote, this contraction will continue indefinitely. But Einstein still couldn't believe it. Oppenheimer was saying that stars can collapse indefinitely, but when Einstein looked at the math, he found that time freezes on the horizon, so it seemed like nothing could ever enter, which suggested that either there's something we don't understand or that black holes can't exist. But Oppenheimer offered a solution to the problem. He said to an outside observer, you could never see anything go in, but if you were traveling across the event horizon, you wouldn't notice anything unusual and you'd go right past it without even knowing it. So how is this possible? We need a space-time diagram of a black hole. On the left is the singularity at r equals zero. The dotted line at r equals 2m is the event horizon. Since the black hole doesn't move, these lines go straight up in time. Now let's see how ingoing and outgoing light rays travel in this curved geometry. When you're really far away, the future light cones are at the usual 45 degrees. But as you get closer to the horizon, the light cones get narrower and narrower until right at the event horizon, they're so narrow that they point straight up. And inside the horizon, the light cones tip to the left. But something strange happens with ingoing light rays. They fall in, but they don't get to r equals 2m. They actually asymptote to that value as time goes to infinity. But they don't end at infinity, right? Mathematically, they are connected and come back in and they're traveling in this direction. And this bothered a lot of people. It's bothered people like Einstein because he, he looked at these equations and went, well, if nothing can, can cross this, this sort of boundary, then how could there be black holes? How could black holes even form? So what is going on here? Well, what's important to recognize is that this diagram is a projection. It's basically a 2D map of four-dimensional curved space-time. It's just like projecting the 3D Earth onto a 2D map. When you do that, you always get distortions. There is no perfectly accurate way to map the Earth onto a 2D surface. But different maps can be useful for different purposes. For example, if you want to keep angles and shapes the same, like if you're sailing across the ocean and you need to find your bearings, you can use the Mercator projection. That's the one Google Maps uses. A downside is that it misrepresents sizes. Africa and Greenland look about the same size, but Africa is actually around 14 times larger. The Gall-Peters projection keeps relative sizes accurate, but as a result, angles and shapes are distorted. In a similar way, we can make different projections of 4D space. Hey, hope you learned the lesson, chat. Pop quiz at the end.